Welcome to the Speak Like a Leader podcast with John Bates. Today with me, I have Dr. Shauna Springer who is someone that I have worked closely with, someone that I feel like I've gotten to know pretty well over some very intimate conversations around some of the presentations and things that she's been up to. And she is a leading expert on PTSD and performance stress. She's a best-selling author. She is highly sought after for media interviews as well. And she has a lot of great insights around leadership and maybe some of the, you know, I guess I would, I would say maybe some of the dark sides of leadership, some of the less illuminated corners of leadership, maybe some of the less thought about aspects of leadership. And you can find her at linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash doc Shauna Springer. That's D O C S H A U N A S P R I N G E R. And that's also her website, docshaunaspringer.com. And she's got some great resources there from a lot of these interviews that she has been doing. Shauna, you've generated a lot of interest lately. Tell us what you've been talking about. Thanks, John. First of all, it's good to be here with you. It's um, great to have you. Yeah, it's not the same as connecting in person, but it's, it's still fun for me. Um, Likewise. I've been doing a lot, of, a lot of work with the uh, media around the impact of trauma and how we can lead ourselves through a time of crisis in a world, frankly, of so many unknowns um, recently. There's just this level of trauma that so many people in America, including leaders, are experiencing, which reminds me of the, the uh, stress and trauma of military leaders that I've worked with for the past decade. Yeah. So you work with a lot of warriors who are, who have experienced PTSD, who are reintegrating into society. Uh, I think that your latest book is called Beyond the Military, A Leader's Handbook for Warrior Reintegration. I've actually written another book. And if I could I do it all over, I would not bring a book out in the middle of a global pandemic. Right. Yeah. When we're talking right now in the you know midst of the global pandemic, and I don't know what I was thinking, but when it all started, my horizon was June and we're yeah. talking and it's July of 2020. And I'm like, okay, that was the horizon. What's happening now? But so you brought out a new book in the midst of the pandemic. And that's, that's, uh, that's what I, uh, that's, what's been generating this huge amount of interest. Tell us about that book. So uh, the one you mentioned, Beyond the Military, did come out in the end of last year, November 2019. So it is a recent release, and it does talk a lot about leadership. It's a leader's guide to uh, warrior reintegration. So mm -hmm. some of that work will apply to our conversation, I'm sure. Of course. This one is called Warrior, How to Support Those Who Protect Us. And it is all about kind of the hidden pain that many of our bravest and strongest citizens carry throughout their lives until we can really understand the story behind the story of where we need to meet them and bring them all the way home. And so a lot of what's in that book also applies to how we can understand our own pain and trauma and lead ourselves through times of massive stress and crisis. Yeah. yeah so, uh, I mean, it, it, one of the things that I have come to believe through all of my work and, um, you know, you could, you could bring your PhD to analyze this with me, but I, I do think that one thing that's interesting is that the highest level of trauma that someone has experienced is the most traumatic thing they've experienced. And to compare traumas <laughs> is ridiculous because even if the worst thing that ever happened to me was that, you know, I didn't get a birthday cake on my sixth birthday, it's still the biggest traumatic thing I've ever experienced. And to compare that to somebody who's been in a war or lost someone they loved or whatever, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You know, uh, the, yeah. the relativity of trauma, I think is something that is an interesting aspect of that discussion. That's such a good point, John. And the thing is that people are often fond of saying trauma is trauma is trauma. 
And they mean it in a kind way to say that, you know, that there's validity and suffering no matter what the source of it is. But that is just not true. So if you think about the different kinds of traumas that people experience, it's often very different to recover from the helplessness or horror of seeing a situation that feels terrifying versus the trauma of a sexual assault where there's not only the helplessness and horror, but there's also like this layer of shame that often yeah. drives people into hiding and creates a whole other complicated process for them to come back from after that kind of trauma. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I think is a great thing for leaders to be aware of is just how much shame there is that goes along with a lot of the traumatic experiences that human beings have, right? And so people are very afraid of revealing themselves. They they have mixed feelings about themselves because of that, even though arguably maybe they shouldn't have those mixed feelings, but it doesn't matter what they should or shouldn't do. They have them. So, you know, what are some of the things that you could say to a corporate audience, let's say, or an audience of, of people leading teams that grows out of your experience with warriors in the military and PTSD you know, how could, what could they learn from what you know there? It's a great question. So here's where I've been thinking about that. Um, taking my background, you know, having a doctoral degree, being in school for a really long time. Essentially, I was socialized in a way to help people lead themselves and to lead people through a process of growth. It's a form of leadership when you go into the work of being a psychologist. And so you come into that relationship with a certain level of rank and expertise and you're socialized to hold that rank and expertise as part of your credibility, that you're the expert in the room. Yeah, this I, is what you were taught, essentially. You were, yeah. so, you were socialized into this because you had a PhD. You should, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And one of the most important lessons for leaders in corporate America, I think, is that trust outranks rank. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. That's gold. Any day of the week, trust outranks rank. That insight, when I sort of put that together with, I don't want to walk into a clinical space ever again and communicate with my behavior, with the way I decorate my office, that I outrank my patients who have had their own suffering and life experience and things they're proud of. I don't ever want to communicate that again. Yeah. I want to be a doc to them. I don't want to be a doctor. I want to be a doc. I want to lay aside what I think I know and walk with them in the valleys of their life. And so applied to corporate leadership, I think one of the really important things I've realized is that the trust we grow with those we lead is really what helps us take them through whatever process we're engaged in to get to a goal. Whether it's a product, a strategy, a vision, it's all about, it's gonna be attuned to the trust that we can develop and hold with those we lead. That's really really beautiful and brilliant. And I think that uh, one of the things that I think we're learning in this you know, time of coronavirus that we're in right now when we're talking, but that's timeless, a timeless lesson, is that uh, I think it's becoming just much more clear, much more quickly, that great leadership is great leadership, and it works no matter what the setting is, you know, we're often on zoom calls all day and stuff, but great leadership still shows up there and is great leadership. And I think that what's becoming really obvious much faster now is how bad, bad leadership is, <laughs> you know, yeah. you, I think that in a physical world where you can walk around and manage by walking around and people are in each other's physical presence, it's easier to, be that kind of dominating iron fist sort of leader and still get something done. But that doesn't work anymore in this. That's setting. the doctor approach. That's the, I'm the expert. I'm the leader. I'm the doctor. And I'm going to tell you what to do. It doesn't work in a, in a place where there's so much trauma that we're all holding. People are looking to their leaders for inspiration and connection yes. to a mission, to a sense of belonging to that team, to that organization. Um, and so one of the things that I'll be kicking off, John, is doing a bunch of leadership talks 
around the concept of this. If your organization were a person, what kind of person would it be? Would it be the kind of person that jumps headlong into partnerships without thinking through the costs and, you know, how the partnership is going to play out? Um, like the person who, you know, gets married in six months, would it be the kind of person who's like the playground bully that like bullies you into submission and punishes you? You know, if your organization were a person, what kind of person would it be? So if we apply the psychology of what health is in terms of personality to a corporation and really develop that, what does that look like? What does healthy, connected, authentic, meaning driven leadership look like? Because nothing else is going to do it in a time of so much trauma. And it, as you said, it's really clear to people what they have as far as leaders right now. That's yeah. really clear. Yeah. So, so, um, so what are some of the more fine distinctions that you could m make for us in terms of communication and leadership? when it comes to just the whole concept of the effects of trauma and, you know, and when you say right now we're all in a time of great trauma and at work there's trauma, I mean, you know, I could imagine someone listening going, well, okay, poor corporate leaders have to work four four day work weeks and they took a 20% reduction in pay. What are you talking about trauma? Like, okay, it's a bummer, but right. So I think that, that to define trauma and to bring some of the finer distinctions of it and how it affects human beings and communication and leadership to, so that it's a finer distinction than just what maybe people might hear initially when they hear, Oh, trauma. Right. Yeah. It's a good point. It kind of goes back to our other conversation about the relativity of trauma. Right. Yes. So some people that we lead, if we're corporate leaders have um, a lot of job insecurity right now, they are, I even corporate leaders have job, job insecurity right now. Yeah, that, that's exactly where I'm going with this, that I think, you know, there's a, a misunderstanding that corporate leaders feel secure and they often feel kind of like the first thing that's going to be sacrificed um, if things don't work out, you know, they're going to be the first to go potentially. So a lot of the corporate leaders I've done consulting with have actually had what I would call something, um, I call it chronic threat response. And it's not the same thing as PTSD. They might never meet criteria. But I've been writing about this a lot in articles recently for CNN and in my book, Warrior. Chronic threat response is you can't sleep. You know, you have this exaggerated startle response. You're overwhelmed by anxiety. Uh, you're overwhelmed by anger or surges of irritability. Um, and you can't concentrate. So there are these symptoms that people have, even if they're leaders, around, am I secure? Am I doing the right thing? If I have to lay people off, um, how do I keep the boat? How do I keep the boat floating? You know, keep the, the ship running here. Right. Um, so I do think there are tensions, but absolutely, I'm not saying that it's the same for people who have lost their jobs, their identities, the, the roles and relationships that give their lives structure and meaning. That is a, trauma, a massive trauma. Um, and so part of that is, is being safe and authentic as we lead people through that trauma. Yeah. Well, you know, and one of the things that I would say, though, is that just because relatively there are different levels of trauma, it doesn't mean, I mean, even being stuck at home for two months is there's something traumatic about that. And, and I think that what we don't maybe talk about enough is the uh, people talked about this a lot right at the beginning, but I think the conversation has shifted away from it. We're all in mourning. We know that there are businesses that we love people who put their whole life's work into something and it was awesome. And it's just been destroyed. And every minute this goes on, more of those things are being destroyed. And to, you know, there are even times when I beat myself up. I'm like, look, I'm at home making freaking sourdough. How can I be this anxious and upset? And how, you know, but it's traumatizing. I, 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 you know, I'm insecure about the future. I know a lot of the people I, I talk to are insecure about the future. Nobody knows what's happening. And 
uncertainty, that level of uncertainty about such important things, I think that does qualify as a trauma. Are there worse traumas? Sure. But I think it's important for people to acknowledge the trauma. And if that's, if I'm not mistaken, that's one of the things that I think comes up in, in your work is, you know, okay, you know, you don't have to be a tough, hardened warrior. You can admit that something was traumatizing. And I think sometimes a lot of times people have a hard time admitting that, right? Yeah. What you don't admit will end up biting you in the back at some point. That's what gets you. That's what gets you. So we, as you said, we tend to shame each other and we tend to shame ourselves around uh, what's the big deal? You know, I have to watch Netflix marathons now because, you know, I have all this free time now. But really, it is uh, really missing the point when we forget that anxiety, as you said, exists in proportion to what we don't know. And we don't know anything right now. (laughs) Yeah. So our anxiety is sky high. And also that it really misses the human psychology of of this point. It is harder for us to do nothing at all than to do something really, really hard. So one of the the talks I gave a few months ago was for the special operations community. And a lot of those warriors, our most elite combat warriors, are unable to deploy. They were just kind of on hold. So being in limbo, they were in their houses, a bit like a caged tiger, you know, ready to go and do what they do and do it really well. Wow. And there's nowhere to go. So although people kind of say, well, what, what happened to them? They had to stay home and like watch more TV and hang out with their kids. That can't be a trauma. It actually can be if you understand sure. the psychology of how warriors are wired to be people of action. And a lot of corporate leaders and people in high profile corporate jobs are also people of action. So being asked to just go home and sit in your foxhole and wait for bad news, that's a terrible formula for mental wellness. It is traumatic. Yeah, yeah. I I think that's really good. And I've been saying to people, you know, brave looks different. (laughs) Typically brave is running towards the danger if you do that right now, you just become part of the problem, right? Brave looks like sitting in your freaking foxhole doing jack nothing, waiting to hear what happened, right? Yeah, so, or wearing a mask when nobody else around you is. Right. And kind of holding your center if you think that that's the right way to protect people yeah. that are vulnerable or healthcare workers on the front lines. That's yep. brave. So, so let's talk about... Um, communication around trauma. Because one of the things that, if I'm not mistaken, I think one of the things that I've gotten from you and other sources that I've looked at, I mean, veteran suicide is something that really bothers me. I I work with our warriors too. My father is a captain, was a captain in the Marine Corps, once a Marine, always a Marine. He's, you know, honorary discharge for medical reasons. He got wounded in Vietnam, but, um, but there's this whole thing of the silent professionals, right? We don't talk about it. That from everything that I know about psychology, and I could be wrong, you correct me if I am, that's like a recipe for disaster around trauma. Yeah. Like don't talk about it is not (laughs) the right advice for overcoming trauma and emerging from PTSD and stuff. So what, what, tell me a little bit about that from your perspective, working with warriors and how you talk to them about that. And then let's generalize that to, uh, you know, entrepreneurs and corporations and stuff. Sure. And by the way, when you told me that your dad was in the Marine Corps and you knew what the great Santini was, (laughs) grew up with him. I was raised by someone that raised me like the great Santini. That was the moment when it clicked in for me. And I was like, we're going to be friends. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And we have been and will be. Yeah. 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 So I think, okay, so about trauma, there's definite and talking about it. You're definitely right. You know, the idea of being a quiet professional and kind of being strong and sort of like the myth of invulnerability in warriors extends to ER docs, nurses, they're wired like warriors in that they're good at controlling a chaotic situation. Um, They can bring a level of mastery to an environment that's kinetic or fluid or dangerous, right? A a lot of the great corporate leaders are that way too. I mean, that's what their day-to-day job feels like too, right? 
exactly where I'm going with this. You read my mind. So they're wired in these similar ways. And there's this immense like pressure, cultural pressure to just hold it in and not share with anyone. So it's a balance between, you know, helping people figure out who is in their tribe and really challenging them to say, if you love and trust those people in your tribe with your life in combat, what does that look like in mental warfare? If you say that you love and trust people, how do we translate that wisdom to mental warfare? Right. So one of the things I've been doing is developing, I'm developing an online course called, um, you know, strategies and solutions for mental warfare. And I'm going to kind of package this and push this out so that people in uh, the warrior community, in the first responder community, in the corporate community, in the medical ER doc community can understand if you're wired like a warrior in different ways that we talked about, how do you push through that sizable cultural stigma and pressure to turn toward those you love and trust to help um, to get the help you need to walk that valley. Cause we all have, we all have them. Yeah. So I love that. And, and, you know, one of the things that I like to go to is just how we evolved as a species and, and, you know, what, what did cave man and cave woman do? And, uh, and what is the neurobiology around these kinds of things? And, and I, I just, I just have to believe that, um, I mean, I get that, you know, men typically in hunter gatherer societies were the ones who would go out and hunt. Right. So they got really, they, they didn't, talk as much when they were hunting, right? They would use hand signals. Why people, st- men still think it's the most rad thing in the world to do hand signals and communicate like in baseball or, you know, you go down here and then turn right. Okay. Got it. You know, right. Do all the little hand signals. We think that's so groovy, right? Because we don't have to talk and scare the animals. But I also, from Can things I that I've read, before you, because that's that's a delicious piece that I just want to get let's in do on. It. Yeah, let's do All it. Right. Let me just say something about that. Yeah, men think that that's so cool. And what they miss is that to get to that goal of like using those implicit signals of like body language and small signs yep. required a lot of intimate and intentional communication. Hey, to that's, get yes, I, I was so, going to say everything it seems to me that. though is that men also talk a lot like in combat, around the fire, in the foxhole, right? I mean. Yeah. All of that to get to the place where you can just signal with your body language, your intention requires a level of overt communication, uh, brave communication, intimate communication. Authentic. To get to that place, right? Yes. And so one of the authentic risk, right? And so it's always funny to me when I have warriors that have married the love of their life, their soulmate. And then they say, well, you know, she can't really understand me. <laughs> you know, like, it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't match up. You know, yeah. you can't understand you because you haven't spent, you know, months and years with her explaining your intentions and talking in these overt ways that you've built into your military training. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's so good. I mean, and you know, there, there's a lot for anybody that's leading a team or interacting with teams of humans in that. And, and I do just think that's, you know, that's another thing that is, I think a huge problem for us right now is that number one, we're all separate. So we can't be together, which is what we long for. It almost makes me cry when times are tough. We want to be with each other and we can't like, that's hard. And then with, with, uh, the protests that are going on and with the place that I think society is in a lot of ways right now with where people are on, on all sides are, are looking to be offended and then lashing out at those that offend them without any regard for actual communication. It's all performance for whoever's following them on social media. I think it becomes even more difficult to talk about anything meaningfully you know, and I think that that is how we as a species work through really difficult things is we talk about it. And yet we've now created for ourselves what what I think is the most toxic environment that maybe has 
almost ever existed. I totally in terms disagree. Of- I, no, agree. I not disagree. I totally agree. I'm excited because you're saying this and I've been really thinking this for a long time because someone wrote an article, John, that said this disease divides and conquers. Wasn't my words, but yeah. that is so true that by putting us into our own little foxholes, it's about the worst thing I could imagine for helping us kind of come together as a society. And what oh. really makes me sad right now is, you know, every year, 4th of July is like a peak part of the year for me because I walk in the parade with the local veterans and yeah. you know, just a time of celebration of their service and the community. And this year, no parades. But on a bigger level, we have never been more divided as a society than we are now. And we're about to celebrate a day that is supposed to be about our national unification and right. who we are as a as one nation, as one yeah. people. And I yeah. feel like we are just scattered to the winds. And that what you're talking about there, that people are looking to be offended. Some of it is for entertainment, I agree. But a lot of it, I think, is really related to how many of us are in chronic threat response mode. Where very, That's a very good point. Yeah. It's like any little thing will cause a flare up of anger because we are so we're holding so much anxiety that we're not uh, in touch with. We're not connected with or we're not registering. So we have to connect to how how we're suffering, the shape of it. And only when we get connection with that, can we get a perspective on it and allow it to um, be there, but not control us, not be our master, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, and it seems to me like one of the most important things to do right off the bat is to just go ahead and acknowledge those places. Like for me, I want like to go ahead and acknowledge those places where I'm trying to like hold the beach ball underwater, you know, like, like uh, I'm a little worried about the future and I'm a little, you know, but I don't want to think about it. Right. Okay. I think admit it maybe admit it in a conversation with a trusted friend or a spouse and just, you know, don't have to get stuck there and stay there forever. But I think admitting where we are is a great thing to do. And then I've, I've personally been trying really hard to create safe spaces for conversation where people don't feel like the whole point of everybody else in the group listening is to look for where they can be offended, but rather to listen for each other, like, yeah. assuming positive intent in this conversation and talking about some of the difficult subjects and, and uh, not just being right all the time, because you, I, I definitely think you can be right or you can be happy. You, you got to commit to one before over the other. And that's what you'll get. You know, yeah. that is a gift that you have your ability to lead people into a safe place and create that group trust, even with differing opinions, is part of leadership. And showing people how to do that well is a gift when we ourselves are suffering from unknowns, from anxiety, from constant pressure and stress that we're all carrying right now. It yeah. takes different forms for different people, but it's, it's there for, for all of us at some level. There's been, as you said, a mourning process, a loss. Um, and I fully agree with you that unless we recognize that with safe people in safe places, it's going to get the better of us. Yeah. You know, another thing about all this, I wonder about your, your, you know, unique and educated perspective on this, but okay. So what you said is absolutely right. This disease divides and conquers. Like we have to physically distance ourselves from each other. We're not getting together. The people from across town who used to at least see each other dropping their kids off at school don't know anything about what's happening in the other person's neighborhood anymore. Very different economic situations. We're not, we don't know what's going on where we used to have some connection. So there's that. Then we're all hunkered down at home, probably spending more time watching the news. Now the news makes its money by being hyperbolic and divisive because that's what sells more. And then all of the social media, all of those algorithms push us further apart because that's what gets us to stay on reading things longer as if we're outraged by something. And so people who lean a little to the right get pushed out to the radical fringe and people who lean a little bit to the left get pushed out to the radical fringe. And 
And so it just seems like a perfect storm for a really major problem in a country that is built upon different groups from all kinds of different backgrounds, from all kinds of different places all over the world getting along. Yeah, I agree. I mean, when you describe it as a really toxic brew, it is. Um, It makes me wonder psychologically, what is it about us as humans that we get so hooked on feeling off balance? You know, yeah, right. It's like, it's almost like we're addicted to just knocking our, ourselves further off balance, right? Yeah. Like if, if we're exposing ourselves to things that we know, we're going to walk out of that stimulus feeling less balanced, less well, and we keep doing it. Right. Whether it's like just going media. back to Apple news, right? <laughs> right? Like, why do we keep going back like the pigeon that's like hitting the, the reinforcement bar? And how is that a reinforcer? Um, you know, I probably could be accused of being less informed than other people because I'm really not interested in a lot of what I want the brief updates on what's happening in the world. But I don't want to sit there and take it in as a consumer in the way that it's fed to me right now. Neither am I interested in much of what's happening on social media. I'm trying to push out stuff that I think is is good information yeah. and aligned with my purpose. But I've probably been less engaged um, on social media, which is, it's a lot, you know, because it's otherwise, you have to like, navigate this just muddy mess of people's like, abusive diatribes and emotions and, right. you know, uncontrolled rage and all of that. And it's just not something I'm up for right now with the work I'm doing. Well, you know, one of the things I think is really important for everybody to truly touch base with and understand is that a lot of the really vitriolic, awful stuff is not even real people. That's places like North Korea, Russia, um, uh, Iran, Those are cyber operations that have been ongoing against America for at least the last 10 years plus, where they are using psychological operations, psyops, to push us apart and amplify any division they can possibly find using social media. So not only do the social media companies themselves have artificial intelligence who who who's unintended purpose is to drive us further apart, but that's being aided and abetted by, by state actors who are actually trying to do that purposefully and consciously. And then we step in and just get battered by that. You know, it is battered is not a bad word for that. You know, you step into like a, a torrent of rage, it would seem. Um, I don't think most people are aware of it. It's really made me not want much to do with a lot of the different platforms. Yeah, no, I, me neither. You know, I, I want to grow my friends locally and, and connect with the people I trust and, you know, build authentic new connections and spend my life doing that and spend yeah. my life doing what I am called to do, which is try and bring our warriors all the way home, try and support them well and help people develop insight about how to support them. I want to, had an ambition this morning to like train the next group of like the army of clinicians that are coming out of graduate schools. I want to use everything I've learned in the past 10 years to train them. And as we train them, I think they can learn the skills they need, not just to support warfighters, but also to be true leaders, you know, to be connected to themselves, to be connected to the people that they're leading, to be vulnerable in the ways that are brave that are harder, harder to do than walk into a firefight. It's harder to tell your wife, I love you and I need you than to walk into a firefight. Um, So there's so much I think we can learn from warfighters that has everything to do with what it means to be a good leader and a valuable citizen in our society. Very much needed, I think. And there's a lot for me in, in the contextualization of courage. Right. Because in a, you know, you don't want a fearless foxhole buddy. People know that, you know, like if you get paired up with the fearless Navy SEAL, you're both going to die, you know, he'll get you killed. But if, 
if you have a courageous foxhole buddy, that's much more, that's a much better thing. And it's also much more inspiring. But how do you switch the context from walking into a firefight to telling your wife, I love you and I need you, right? Yeah. And similar, similar, how do you recontextualize the bravery and the courage it takes to be a top corporate leader at a huge global company? How do you recontextualize that courage into being kind to your employees and creating a safe space so they don't fight each other? They, they fight the competition instead, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you used bravery and courage as separate things, which they are. A lot of people tend to put those together. You know, bravery is courage and they're used as synonyms. They're not the same thing. Um, I think of bravery as, you know, doing the hard thing, like swimming upstream against what you naturally want to do or taking the harder path because it's the right path, even if it's hard in the short term. Courage, I learned a few months ago, actually means something different. It means to say what is in your heart. It comes from, yeah, it comes from the root of the word, the heart. And that is a different thing entirely than just sheer bravery. Yeah. So let's go back to the foxhole for a second. So as you said, you don't want to be in the foxhole with someone who's fearless, right? Yeah. That person is what maybe we would call someone in the berserk state, this frenetic, frenzied, violent I'm invulnerable. No one can take me out. I'm immortal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, the root of that, interestingly, is bear sark. And this comes from Jonathan Shea's work. He was a psychiatrist from Harvard, done beautiful work on moral injury. Bear sark means without armor. So that was the ancient peoples that would race over the plains with their hair wild and wearing no armor because they felt like no matter what, nobody could touch them. That's not desirable. That's like totally disconnected from the situation that we're in. And what you really want is somebody with both courage, who is connected to the heart of what they're about, and brave, who is willing to do the right thing, even when it's the hard thing, and talk about their process with those they lead, because the leadership gives space for other people to grow. And to become people that can be more brave and more courageous. That that is set by our leaders in many cases. Yeah. If that makes sense. Certainly a leadership opportunity. Yeah. To be that person. That's fabulous. Yeah, I love that. That's great. And that, you know, that is, I think, one of the things that is we're being pushed into more in some ways now just with everything that's going on at this moment as we're talking is that the 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 power and the vulnerability and the 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 fear of really being authentic you know it it's it's more important now i think than ever and it's it's never going to be easy all the way tr- yeah. to be truly authentic and and vulnerable and open but I think that's what this distributed form, especially, but any kind of good leadership, I think, demands that. Right. I mean, as a therapist working with warfighters, I used to take them through a very quick process and say, you know, would you agree that a warrior does the hard thing, not the easy thing? They take the hard path. And they would say, oh, yes, definitely. You know, that's what I'm trained to do and have the right kind of pride about that, right? That's what a warrior does. Okay. Now, Um, What's your goal in your marriage? Do you want your wife to feel like she's a member of your tribe, that she's included in your circle of trust, that you love her, that you're close to her, that you have this bond with her? Yeah, I, I want that. Yeah. Okay. So with that goal in mind, what is the harder thing here? Is it to say, I love you and I need you and take your armor off with your wife? Or is it to just continue to express the myth of your personal invulnerability to suffering? And then they have to respond that the harder path is to tell their wife. And so then we just kind of in a, you know, agreeable way, we say, that's why you were made to be a warrior. Now go and do that. Yeah. And they will, they will, that's how you migrate it. Yeah. You help them make the translation. Same thing for leaders. If you call yourself a leader and you think you're a leader, then that means doing the hard thing because it's the right thing. 
Yeah. And the hard thing is the vulnerable thing in many yes, cases. So much harder. I know that. Yeah. Yeah. Much harder. Yeah. Boy, that's fabulous. I love that. That's a great, that's a great frame shifter, right? Fabulous. So let's talk for a minute because this goes back to something that you said earlier, I think, in terms of you not wanting to ever set things up so that patients who come to you and trust you and want to talk to you feel like you set it up so you outrank them. I think that there's a certain, one of the things that I work with individuals and companies and people on a lot and we've talked about this is the whole thing of be responsible, not just for what you say, but for what they hear. Mm -hmm. And I think that you had a fabulous insight and I just have to believe this translates into a lot of other areas of life, but I think you had a fabulous insight with the warrior box. Will you tell us about that? Yeah. Thank you for asking. So the warrior box project was a collaboration with a Marine Corps veteran um, that I've known for years. He was one of my first patients back in 2009 at the VA. And I was really worried that I would lose him. You know, we had one of those sessions where... I mean, when you say lose him, you don't mean he would leave you as a client. <laughs> no, no. You mean lose him no. from planet Earth, right? To I suicide. mean, like, yeah. I would be the last person to see him alive, lose him right, to suicide. So my gut came up into my throat and I, I just walked home that, you know, day with such a feeling of um, anxiety and sort of impending dread. And it kept me up at night. I mean, that was one of those sessions where I was desperate to answer the question I had for years. Is there anything we can do when someone was fully bent on their self-destruction? When you're working with a Marine who moves with purpose when he sees himself as a threat to his family's future well-being or safety, is there anything that can stop a warfighter like that from taking himself out? And I had this realization at like three in the morning that it, it hit me so hard that I got out of bed and I wrote it down. And I sent an email to myself. Um, and it was this, that the things that warriors would die for in battle, the people and the values that they would die for in battle are the same things that have stopping power in mental warfare. Yeah. And it makes me cry. It's so beautiful. It's such a great insight. Tell us what you did with it. Yeah. So I realized that these sacred values and these people that they would protect with their lives in battle are the same things that will stand between them and a self-destructive urge. So I thought there's got to be a way to bring all of that into a tangible form, not an app, not a website, not something sort of abstract and intangible that warriors are not interested in, something super tangible and basic they can hold and touch. And so we took an ammo can and we created this war chest for mental warfare. We filled it up with tangible things that people would die for in battle. So my original patient zero was that Marine. I came back in and I said, I have this idea. I want to know what you think of it. And he filled that warrior box up with pieces of shrapnel that had been in his body that had almost killed him. His rosary, he was Catholic, is Catholic. He's still with us. His wife's wedding vows, pictures of his fellow combat Marines, letters from people he loves, all of these tangible items that remind him of the sacred values he would die for in battle. And at the bottom of that box, he put the key to his firearm lock so that he would have to dig through everything he told me was sacred to him before he made that decision to take himself out. So at the end of that tunnel, he had that dark night of the soul. It came, you know, weeks, months after this, where his demons were screaming at him and the walls are closing in. And he's at the end of that tunnel and he's, he gets this flash of anger because his firearm is locked up and his key is at the bottom of the warrior box project that we've been working on developing out. So he gets his warrior box and he throws it out on the table and this piece of light from a street light outside catches on a piece of shrapnel that was in his face. And then it hits his wife's wedding vows. And all of a sudden this kinetic environment just freezes. And he sees these things, these tangible objects that represent everything that he would die for 
and it stops this Marine in his tracks. And he says, I can hear my wife now. And she's pulling at me and begging me, don't do it. I couldn't hear her. I was, he was in such a, an activated, I'm moving with purpose on the threat, the threat is me kind of mode that he couldn't feel his wife dragging at him. Physically really there, not just mentally. Physically pulling at him, he couldn't feel her on his body. And then he heard her voice and he felt her and he stopped himself. Yeah. And he came back to me and he said, Doc, I, I want to transfer to a different provider. So in fact, I did lose my patient in that sense. <laughs> yeah. But he said, the reason is because I think you're onto something. And I want to co-develop this with you because we can save my brothers and sisters in arms. And so we, we've developed that idea out. We have a whole kit that goes inside of these ammo cans that gives people a packing list and things that they can do to make this happen um, as a, a tool, a deterrent for the mental warfare that that we all face at times in life. So now is that warriorbox.com or? What? Um, it's on my website, docshawnaspringer.com. Doc Springer. Go yeah, there. On the main page, if you scroll down, there's a box that says the Warrior Box Project. Um, it's one of the things I think has such great potential that has not been tapped uh, to anywhere near its full potential. Mm -hmm. We've been giving them out at um, closed reunions of Marines, and it's it's getting so much traction in these sort of like quiet professional ways, right? Yeah, but yeah. It really is, is it has not hit a tipping point in awareness. So well, maybe we can help with that. You know, I'm going to think of who who else I could tell. Um, there's another part of this story that I'm thinking about that I think is is an illustration of 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 how you think differently than perhaps most. PhDs who are working with with our warriors. And it came to you when you were having a conversation with someone about like whether they had a firearm and do you want to leave it with me? When, right. Will you tell us that story? Because I think with that too, there's there's such a willingness to just be responsible for what's going to work versus anything else. Right. Like letting go of that facade of I outrank you and I know what's best and stepping into their world, right? Yeah. yeah. So tell us about that. The insight there goes back to how in the military, losing access to your firearm is a um, something that is done by someone in a position of rank and authority who says you're not competent to hold firearm privileges. And when they take your firearm away, it causes a, a deep level of shame for many service members and it rocks their identity and their sense of relevance to the tribe of those they, they love and support when they lose a critical function. So the, and you know, like the, the yeah. only other place that someone might lose a firearm is if they freaking drop it in combat, <laughs> that right. also sucks, <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. So either way, right. If you drop it enough times in combat, you're going to lose it as well. You know? So um, right. So with it, it's like a, a deep hit to their sense of identity as a warrior. And so what happens is we as clinicians coming up in a system where we're taught to just like ask the question and go after that because, you know, firearms can cause suicide if they're not properly managed and maintained. We're trained to just go in and say, do you own firearms? And if so, how are you storing them? And we, I think, lack an awareness of how deeply disrespectful that feels for those uh, who own firearms as an extension of their warrior identity and how that conversation is incredibly risky and emotionally loaded for them. And if we don't approach it from a strategic perspective, we will lose those patients to follow up. They'll drop out of treatment. That I mean, could people do that all the time. All the time. Right? All the time. Um, I can't prove this, John, but I feel like there's got to be some proportion of like 14 or 20 veterans who die by suicide are not engaged in VA healthcare. And I can't prove this, but in my own observation, I wonder how many of those people are avoiding care because of this widespread fear that so many warriors have that if they enter a system of care, they're going to get this question, it will be documented in their records, and then somebody will come to their house and remove their firearms. Even if it never happens, it's a fear. Ask any warrior, it's a fear. And that fear is driving 
their ability to engage in really good care that the VA could offer that could save their lives. So it's it's a frustrating deficit of trust that I would really like to bring to people's awareness. And that's why I wrote Warrior, How to Support Those Who Protect Us. Yeah, that it's really fabulous. And I think it's uh, insightful on your part to to get that and then be willing to deal with how it is versus maybe how people think it should be or they'd like it to be or the people training the clinicians think it ought to be because <laughs> it, it ain't none of that. It is how it is. And I think that that willingness to engage in reality versus anything else in terms of should or would or whatever is, uh, you know, th- that I think that that makes you far more successful in what you do. And I think that, that generalizing that willingness and what I think is actually generosity to be that way and communicate that way and take that on is a huge positive step for a leader anywhere. Yeah. Thank you for that. You know how we talked about how traumatic situations really make clear whether you have a leader or somebody who's (laughs) really just uh, posing as a leader. Mm -hmm. My book, the content in it is not the standard status quo counsel. And I want to train clinicians, whether they're already working in the field um, or they're coming up in the field, in all of these insights I've gained from warriors in the past 10 years. And in the same way, we're going to see where people's hearts are at. Because those who are about this work as a, a sacred mission, like me, who say, it is my purpose to support warriors and bring them all the way home. They're going to be humble enough to say, who am I to them? And how can I improve my approach to practice to better engage them in care? And the ones that are like, I'm an expert. I know what I know. They're going to see me as the enemy. I can tell you right now, I'm not looking forward to that, but I'm going to encounter a wall of resistance from people who think they know what they know. And that's the really hard part of this is, I just want to serve these people that I respect so much and hope that my fellow professionals would be open to hearing not what I have to say, but what they have to say. I'm, I'm writing up their insights and saying, here's the story behind the story that they're not telling us, that they didn't tell me until I gained their trust. The first thing we tell you, it's a test of trust. Yeah. Same thing with leadership in corporate America. If you have a report that comes to you, and they're a little bit vulnerable. That's a test of trust. Yeah. And how you handle that will tell that person so much about whether you're capable of hearing what they need to share or whether they need to go in hiding with their insights and what they could bring to the table. So it's kind of a high stakes um, you know, engagement that you have when you're coming in as a leader. And that's why trust outranks rank. Yeah, I love that. Trust outranks rank. It's it's so perfect. Uh, you know, um, gosh, there was something else that you made me think of, but now it's gone. Um, is there, so, oh, it, you know, it. I think that what I was going to say is just that that whole thing of, of being a place where, where your employees can come trust you and tell you about a failure as safely as they can tell you about a success you know, that's just even more important when companies are working in a distributed fashion because everything is now so opaque and you don't get to see people except for what they're showing you on that little camera in Zoom on a day, you know, in your daily meetings or whatever. If if you as a leader are not the place where they can say the difficult things and still feel safe and valued then you're not going to hear the difficult things till they take you out. You know? That's right. That's right. It's going to go underground and then you're creating vulnerability for your organization and for yourself in the long run. So it's, it's a lot like, you know, training future psychologists. I was a supervisor. And so if they don't tell me when their session went badly, when they had a train wreck, so we yeah. can get in there and talk about it and kind of work on that. Um, I'm never going to hear it. And I'm going to graduate people that don't get it and that never had those deficits addressed. 
But one of the best ways to do that, this is the catch. One of the best ways to do that is you create space for people to do that by sharing your own failures. And that is so hard to do. The more status you have, the more prestige you have, the harder it is to do that. And the more courage and bravery it takes to do that. And what I've noticed is that a lot of people, the more they get to be experts, the more they protect themselves and they protect their sense of expertise rather than say, boy, I really messed that one up. Or let me show you some tape of something I did, or let me bring my patient in and we can talk about the things I missed as we were building. Right. Doing those kinds of things as a corporate leader is extremely valuable. Because it communicates with your actions, not just words, that you really do uh, see the whole person and don't sort of like create a um, a sense that they are the sum of their failures. Yeah, absolutely. I just couldn't agree more. I think that sharing your failures and what you learn from your failures, and in fact, I've I've been coining the term, Shauna, uh, insightful vulnerability. Uh Not just vulnerability, right? Not just, oh, I'm scared. Are you scared? No, I'm scared. And here's what I'm doing about it. You know, here's what I've been thinking. Here's what I've been taking on. I've been doing this. I've been doing that. So the vulnerability and the authenticity, along with the insight of what came out of that for you, I think is a, it's one of the most powerful leadership opportunities ever because everybody wants to go second but nobody wants to go first. We'd love to talk about where we failed and what we learned, but no one's going to start that. Yeah. But if somebody starts that, that conversation will shut the bar down. You know, nobody will forget that for the rest of their lives. But who's going to start it, right? Oh, a leader. In my and group. It's hard, right? All right. I'm sitting with a combat veteran group, right? And I would just say, which one of you is brave enough to walk point today? Right? <laughs> 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 yeah. combat, right? The person yeah. who walks point is the person who takes the, the biggest risk. The, yeah. And yeah. Right? you can quickly reframe it by which one of you is bravest enough to walk point and then they never get stuck because yeah. they are brave. You just need to yeah. kind of put it to them in those terms and then you inspire their inherent bravery in their spirit. You know, it reminds me, our, our mutual friend, Josh Mons, yes. used to say, he used to say something like, Uh, that one of his mentors said to him, the value of therapy is to help people suffer productively. And I think that applies here because, you know, walking point, talking about our vulnerabilities is a form of suffering. But as you said, it's not just vulnerability for vulnerability's sake. And the story shouldn't stop at like, I don't have it all figured out. The story Uh should be right about the process that we bring to this as leaders to show how we got from point A, which was failure, to point B, or seeing something we didn't see about ourselves, the project, yeah. the goals. Um, there should be more to the story. So you have to yeah. think about why am I sharing this? Who is it for? What is the end point? And how does it give permission to people to not just be vulnerable, but to grow through yes. their vulnerabilities? Fabulous. Fabulous. I love that. And you know, it, what, in your book and in your willingness to, I guess you could say, take on the establishment. One of the things that I was taught a long time ago that has just made an enormous difference for me is that there is actually no such thing as arrogance. There's no such thing as an arrogant person. Arrogance is just always and only another face for fear. Mm. And when I started taking that on, you know, the people that are not going to get your message and that might even resist your message and push back on it, I think it would be interesting to look at them as what are they afraid of and how can I actually genuinely allay those fears and put them at ease because this arrogant, I'm the boss, I'm a doctor, I know better reaction is actually just driven by an underlying fear of maybe not being good enough or, you know, whatever. Yeah. I, I really hope that I don't come to be seen as someone who is taking on the establishment for. Okay. Well, don't let, yeah. hopefully I didn't start anything. No, no, that's, that's okay. But I think, I think it, it, you know, my fear, my fear, right. Is that people would misperceive that, 
you know, so one of the things that, you know, I've been communicating to the powers that be, for example, in the VA system is that I was at the VA for eight years to the day because that Mm -hmm. was investment. So I came to that whole assignment in my, I didn't, I signed myself basically to work there for, for eight years because that was my way of serving. And that when I left, you know, my last performance bonus pay went to a picnic table for all of my colleagues. And I maintained warm and positive relationships with my colleagues. And I think there are good docs in the VA. I, I don't think that um, the problem is that everybody in the VA system is not competent to work. You know, that that's not what I'm saying. No. At all. I'm saying that many people, if they understood some of the things that I've learned from warriors through a humbling process of growth, could actually do even more fully the work that they were designed to do. And so I hope that when I go to the powers that be, that they they don't see me as a threat, but as an ally, and I'm an asset. And I just want to like help bridge that cultural divide and that deficit of trust so that that army of providers that's there can operate to the fullest potential. And I've learned those lessons myself in very, very humbling ways. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think that's fabulous. And I do think that there is maybe nothing more powerful than really getting people to understand that we both have the same ultimate goal, <laughs> you yeah. know? Um yeah. And I think that, you know, all the things that I've been seeing you do and the times that we've talked and the things that I've heard you do in the media and things, uh, I think that anybody that's paying attention would understand where you're really coming from. So, you know, I think that that's a a huge bonus for you on your side. I hope so. I hope it's not not threatening to people. Uh, Can't control it. But yeah, that's my goal is to be an asset and an ally to the yeah. people in the front lines. That's awesome. Well, so is there is there, you know I I noticed that we're at the top of the hour and we should I should probably respect your time and let you go even though I'd love to talk longer. Is there is there anything else that you like that's maybe gone through your mind that you didn't say or anything to you know around your experiences you'd like to share? I've certainly got a few more minutes if you do. I sure do. I sure. And I, I didn't even notice the time, you know, that's part of being in flow, right? So you're, there you you're go. Right. Someone, you don't even notice the time. I, I didn't even realize we had been talking for an hour, but I think one of the things that is really important around leadership that I've drawn from my work in the military, because so much of that work helps me help corporate leaders now is right. there is a huge difference for those that you lead um, from leading from the front and leading from a safe remove. So if you are distant from the risk that you're asking other people to take, that's going to come through to them. The concept of leading from the front is getting right in there, in the trenches with them at some level and uh, walking with them in that place of danger and risk and doing it in real time where they can see you doing it. It's very important for them to observe you taking those risks. And that concept of leading from the front is another part of, I think, good leadership that that we hadn't talked about today, but that that feels very important to me. You know, and, and it's funny that you would say that to me because my the book that I'm reading right now is the 1939 book called Infantry in Battle. The Infantry Journal Incorporated, Washington, D.C., 1939. And essentially what it is, is a debrief of World War I and a whole bunch of individual human-sized battles on, you know, that ranged, like most of them happen within about one and a half or two kilometers square. And they talk about the whole engagement in that size of a of an area. And one of the thing the the chapter i just read was about so the whole thing to me seems to basically come down to keep it simple mm-hmm. and communication is the ultimate most important thing right if your order can be misinterpreted it will be if your order is too complicated it, they won't people won't be able to follow it make sure you keep the lines of communication open somehow right all that stuff and and 
what they were saying is that if you're the, you know, if you're the commander and you can't actually see what's going on on the battlefield, if you have placed your command post safely far enough away that you're not seeing this stuff, yeah. you, that's just setting yourself up for ultra failure already. And there's, there's just story after story after story of just units getting decimated versus units pulling it out, even though all, everything went wrong, they still won the battle and lost a lot fewer people purely because of where the commander chose to put himself yep. and how close to the, to the action he was and able to see and, you know, so I it's yeah. You're you're really going after I think the the intel gap, right? That exists if you are at a safer move, you can't sort of see in real time how you need to position people, and that is certainly a factor. But I think I would add to that that there's also this psychological relational layer there. Absolutely, there, right? Absolutely. You know, People are as courageous as their leaders. And exactly. If, right. If you yep. see the leader take those risks, it pushes you, it inspires you to bring your best game to every. That's right. Yep. Um, so if you don't see that and your leader is kind of sitting back and, you know, making a, a you know, decisions from some safe position, then it impacts morale at a level that translates into how well you, you fight that battle. Yeah, absolutely. And listen, this book even that I'm reading, I mean, that is clearly part of the message as well. Yeah. And and I think, you know, in my work, I talk a lot about mirror neurons. I mean, yeah. you know, could very well come down to that, right? You're going to do, I mean, it always does, right? You're going to do it the way you see your leader do it. So, you know, <laughs> leaders are actually responsible for how their people are doing it because everybody's just mirror, mirroring you, the leader. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, if we're going to pay our leaders and give them these positions, like people ought to understand that it's really, it's a challenge to lead and to right. do it well requires courage and commitment and yeah. oh. integrity and um, sacrifice and service to those that you're leading. It's not, you know, all of the good stuff and none of the sacrifice. Um, it, it has to be all part of one bundle that the rewards are part of the sacrifice that you make to lead. Yeah. Yeah. It is always an act of courage and generosity to do anything that gets you noticed by the group, particularly I think in a leadership role, because then, you know, you're the one under the microscope, right? Definitely. So, so that's, that's great. And uh, so, uh, you know, I'm just so happy to, talk to you and see you. And I'm so proud of you. I've been watching your journey and you've taken such ground and I'm just really, really proud of you. And I know it, it has been an act of courage and generosity for you, right? It has not always been easy. It has often been scary and it has always been worth it. Yeah. And I'd love to tell you an update. That's just so fun. Please. So yeah. Yeah. You, as you know, have had a foundational like role in my life in terms of helping me become a better speaker and really kind of sharpening my speaking skills. I'm sure I still have much to learn, but um, you've really helped me. And I just signed an agreement with a speaking representative that has represented Oprah in the past and Peter Drucker and Desmond Tutu and um, just other people that are just world-class speakers and leaders. And he's going to help continue to develop me, but I, I, I so value, you know, our continued relationship and I'm grateful to you, John for, and I see that as a measure of your success in what you do. So I would just say to your audience, like, if you want to hone your speaking skills, go see John Bates. <laughs> he is <laughs> so good with that. That's your genius. Um, and so I just want to get that feedback and that outcome from some of the work that we did. Um, That's so that. great. I am so happy for you. And I'm so proud of you. That is quite a roster that you are now a part of. And, and I, and, you know, I, I so number one, just thank you. I, I get that compliment and it does feel like a, a success for me too, obviously a hundred percent. And, and uh, I really, 
I, I appreciate you giving your message. Guys, it's going to make me cry. I appreciate you giving your message, the attention and the care and the love and the time and the focus and the devotion that it deserves. Because that's just going to increase the difference that you get to make with that message for people that are quite actually dying to hear from you. Yeah, I didn't think I was going to cry, but we do what we do because of a love and respect. Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. It's so great to see you, Shauna. Thank you for coming. Anytime. All right. And I guess people can call you Doc. If they Doc do, Springer. it's an honor yeah. to me when they do. I don't yeah. really care about Dr. Springer. I do have the PhD, but Doc is about the trust that I, I hold with people. And that to me is just, it's a beautiful thing that I try to to honor with my relationships. Great. Well then it, in that context, you are always Doc to me. So thanks for coming, Doc. Thanks, John. Thank you for joining the Speak Like a Leader podcast. Go be awesome.